On a recent morning, far too early, my two-year-old climbed onto my bed and body slammed me. I am a strong wake-upper, she declared. Apparently, my efforts to express alternatives to a good or bad framing of her experience are paying off. I'm really trying to model to my little one that she need not bear the title of good girl in this lifetime. Rather than being sugar and spice and everything nice, she regularly reminds us she's just a kid, not a girl, let alone a good girl. My move away from these black and white dichotomies of good and bad and right and wrong has been more than a decade-long project involving a lot of therapy as well as a significant career change. I stepped off the good academic and righteous social justice educator track and became, indeed I'm still becoming, a trauma therapist and an imperfect one at that. Through my participation in a mindfulness community, I came to appreciate how aversive judgment is a form of aggression. By aversive judgment, I mean when we make something or someone bad or wrong. When it is inside our heads, aversive judgment acts like a bully, making us want to cower and hide under the covers. When we express aversive judgment outwardly, it spurs defensiveness and hostility. Ultimately, these internal and external battlefields leave everyone diminished. As a psychotherapist, I've witnessed the protection that such judgment provides and the trauma that frequently accompanies it. Since trauma is one of those terms thrown around a lot these days, I want to clarify its definition. What trauma is not is discomfort or mild distress. Rather, it is a severe emotional blow that is experienced as a threat to our very being. That threat can be felt at the individual or interpersonal level, as well as more collectively such as when a group of people has been persecuted. Oftentimes, trauma involves a missing emotional and or physical experience, like being seen and valued as we are by a primary caregiver, or being able to successfully evade harm. As a body-based trauma therapist, I invite people to complete an action today that they could not complete at the time they experienced the trauma. Releasing the trauma stuck in our bodies, such as through movement, can bring relief and even a sense of triumph. Now back to the judgment. The most mean-spirited kind accompanying trauma frequently is aimed at ourselves. For example, I knew a man who endured significant childhood abuse. As a middle-aged perfectionist, virtually the only voice in his head was that of a ferocious inner critic. It was as if a torturer had taken residence in his brain. In deep despair, he took his own life. I still wonder if he might be with us today had he been able to stop directing at himself the fight response he could not carry out as a young child. His story stands in contrast to that of a woman who, during the course of trauma therapy, contacted the terrified five-year-old behind her own vicious inner critic. She heard that child part ask, will you protect me? Will you honor me? Her adult self answered yes. In so doing, she finally trusted that she could lay down her sword and her shield, and her heart broke wide open. The powerlessness that trauma triggers can send us straight onto the Cartman drama triangle. Despite how complex reality is, we reduce it to the simplest of equations. We shrink whole people into caricatures. For example, I encountered a man who spewed homophobic slurs within minutes of meeting me. He did not know he was speaking with a queer woman. My heart racing, I almost followed my impulse to fling judgment right back at him. Instead, I slowed way down and listened more carefully to his story. Within it was an episode of sexual assault by a gay man when he was a young adult. This unprocessed trauma contributed to him assuming the role of a victim and positioning LGBTQ people as persecutors from whom he needed to be rescued. Blaming and shaming others diverted attention away from his vulnerability and the necessary working through of a personal nightmare. Another seducer onto the Cartman Triangle is believing we are good because dominant social norms deem us worthy or smart or successful. 
Thinking we are exceptional sets us up to look down on others and so take on the role of a paternalistic rescuer who needs to save the poor victims unable to take care of themselves. When we see this dynamic clearly, we no longer can claim as mutually beneficial a relationship that strips people of their self-determination. Then there is righteousness. Thinking we are right stops learning in its tracks. We need inquire no further because we have all the answers. Being right also stunts growth, which requires wading into the discomfort of not knowing everything. While trying so hard to prove we are right, we miss the opportunity to listen, and through that listening, to deepen our understanding of the world and ourselves. So the flip side of aversive judgment, to be good and right, generates its own harm. A moment from my undergraduate years at a prestigious university speaks to how damaging this logic can be. During a Western civilization course, a peer scoffed at the idea that all human lives are of equal value. Do you really think your life isn't more important than other people's, he mocked. He dared to say aloud the message many of us at this elite university had absorbed over the years. In our homes, in our honors classes, from the society. We are better than you. He mistook social advantage for inherent superiority. Yes, all lives matter. In the context of this country, however, where teaching our children to value some lives over others is a common and centuries-old practice, these words ring hollow. What is more, we rarely acknowledge the harmful impact on everybody of being good and right. Viewing ourselves as better than other people blocks us from feeling the significant alienation that such separation creates. The reality that we belong to each other becomes unimaginable from up on this perch, as does a sense of social responsibility born of our interconnectedness. Just to be clear, we cannot bypass the field of difference to touch that oneness. Oppressive systems disproportionately impact specific groups of people, and those differences matter. Black lives matter. Becoming intimate with those disproportionate and brutal impacts matter. The many brave individuals who have shared their stories of abuse and discrimination keep the arc of the moral universe bending toward justice, often at great expense to themselves and without protection from retaliation or even death. My wish is that we refuse to step onto that Cartman Triangle as we continue to challenge harmful systems, especially since identifying with the victim role erases our own power. This, of course, is easier said than done. The resurgence of the Me Too campaign, to highlight one current movement, has simultaneously inspired and jarred many of us. Demonizing men is extremely tempting after hearing so many horrific narratives. And I again want to be crystal clear that I am not saying we need to tolerate abuse. Setting boundaries when we can to safeguard our well-being and holding people accountable for their harmful actions are actually ways to get off that triangle. Making someone the bad guy, on the other hand, tends to ignore the 10,000 moments upstream of this one. Patriarchy, like other social afflictions in this country, has massive and entangled roots. None of us swims through its toxic waters unscathed. Significant unlearning of what has become deeply familiar, even by those of us most harmed by misogyny, will accompany the building of a more humane world. I would argue that the top-down structures still dominating this society are outdated and violent survival strategies, rather than something bad or wrong. When healing trauma, integration is the goal, not transcendence. If we do not take hierarchies for granted as the right or only way, we have abundant possibilities to explore, especially since integration aligns more with a circle than a ladder. We also have significant reparations to make. I like to imagine what could happen in this country if we stop trying to surpass others, as well as our current and former selves. If we ceased and desisted the chase for that rubber stamp of external approval or the nonstop quest for self-improvement, and instead sought to integrate the parts of ourselves we lost along the way, to live from a sense of wholeness. My experience suggests we would be traveling down a path of restoring the dignity that's a birthright to us all. 
I want to reiterate my attention on harmful behaviors, not evil characters, when tackling social injustice. We only can observe in others what is also in ourselves, and we all have a shadow side. Instead of bringing more aggression into the world by making others bad and wrong, I ask that, whenever possible, we pause upon contacting the darkness of these times. In that pause, we have the opportunity to ground and center our bodies, enable wisdom rather than fear to drive our thinking, and ultimately to respond, not react. Since our lives involve bodies and emotions in addition to thoughts, I will close by asking you to engage in an experiential activity with me. Borrowing from the Tibetan Buddhist practice of Tonglen, I invite you to act as a compassionate witness to those experiencing overwhelming pain. The exercise involves breathing in our own or others suffering and breathing out wishes of well-being. So on this in-breath, if you will join me, I'm taking in the many years of self-doubt, shame, and anxiety of several individuals I have met who were sexually abused as young children. And on my out-breath, I'm wishing them ease, self-acceptance, and the ability to feel safe in their bodies. Breathing in pain may seem like a terrible idea. After all, most of us are pros at running away from it as fast as we possibly can. But we're not wishing for the suffering to be there in this practice. We're acknowledging the pain because that is what is here right now. It's a way to stop fleeing from the truth. And again, if you will join me, I'm now breathing in the terror, danger, and displacement experienced by refugees around the world. And on my out-breath, I'm wishing them physical security, comfortable shelter, and a welcoming community. This exercise is not a substitute for political action. It is a practice that allows us to observe whether or not we can, in this moment, turn toward others and our own pain. May we cultivate the courage to perceive reality as it is and respond to that awareness with an awake heart. Thank you.